I call the Honourable Mia Davies. Thank you, Mr President. And could I congratulate you on your recent election. I look forward to working with you in this chamber. I would also like to extend my thanks to the clerk and staff of Parliament House who have made the new members feel welcome and provided us with valuable guidance. It is with respect that I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. And can I also acknowledge my friends and family who have joined us this evening in the gallery and those who are watching via the World Wide Web. It is wonderful to have you close by as I shake my way through my first address to this house. Mr President, it is indeed a humbling experience to realise you have been elected to be one of just 95 people who sit in this parliament and have responsibility for legislation that will impact on the lives of every person of this state. I remember the day that Colin Holt, Philip Gardner, Max Trenorden and I were confirmed elected for more than one reason. Without doubt, there was a sense of personal achievement to think that a girl from the bush could end up in this place. But more importantly, I recall the moment my name, along with those of Philip Gardner's and Max Trenorden's, appeared on the screen at the Fremantle passenger terminal the day they finalised the count for the agricultural region as being a triumph for the Nationals WA and the people of regional Western Australia. On that day, our small political party, with the lofty aim of holding the balance of power in the parliament and delivering our key election commitment, royalties for regions, had achieved what the pundits had claimed impossible. I will talk about royalties for regions later. But at this stage, perhaps I could ask for members' indulgence as I tell you how it is that a girl from the bush ended up in this place. If what my honourable colleague Colin Holt said in his maiden speech is true, that all the things we have done in our past is preparation for what we are about to take on, then it would seem a life in politics was a path set for me some years ago. Mr President, I grew up in the central wheat belt on a family farm in York Rakhine an area between Tamman and Wildcatcham, approximately 200 kilometres northeast of Perth. I would like to paint a picture for members, one that illustrates the humble beginnings of many families in this region. In April 1908, the then Minister for Agriculture and Land, Sir James Mitchell, having traversed the area between Tamman and York Rakhine Hill, arranged for 51 sections to be surveyed in the York Rakhine coral locking areas. Blocks of country were valued at 10 to 12 shillings per acre, with the payment to be made over 25 years. In 1899, labourers' wages started at seven shillings per day and a man, horse and cart could be hired for 10. In today's prices, this equates to land values of $1.50 per acre, labourers' wages at $1 per day and the bargain price of $1.50 for a man, horse and cart. How times have changed. Unemployed and married folk with large families were invited to apply through the local press and of the original settlers, five of the families had ten, ten or more children. The smallest family consisted of six. These families eked out a living in a harsh and unforgiving environment. They lived in houses made of hessian bags and corrugated iron with dirt floors while they cleared the land for farming. They did it with no mechanical equipment, just sheer hard yakka. In amongst this, they found time to build their community, open a general store, build a town hall for gatherings and form sporting clubs. The schools, hospitals and sealed roads came much later. They built their communities from scratch, with little assistance from the, assistance from the government of the day. In fact, Sir Mitchell was blamed for his bland optimism in allegedly throwing new settlers into the bush with just an axe, claiming that new, new railways and a little muscular activity only were required for success. He became the prime target for the Farmers and Settlers Association, founded in 1912 and two years later, the association returned eight country party members to the parliament. Today, there are less families and bigger farms. Ten families remain in the area of the original 51. Names like the Hutchisons, the Ryans, Everett's, Tilbrooks, Charlton's, Knox, Norton's, Maitland's and Faulkner's are still there. Other early settlers, including my family, are also in the district, along with the De Pierres, the Divers and the Mackins. My childhood was spent on the family farm, my mum returned to Wiley and with Dad the year I was born and remained there for the next 20 years. Dad, his brothers and their wives worked with my grandfather Lloyd and my dear Nana Iris and built the property and a merino stud into a successful business enterprise. I know that Nana and Pop would have been so proud to see me standing here today. My primary school years were spent at the Wildcatcham District High School, 
It was a small community and I am privileged to say that I still count some of these schoolmates as my close friends. Boarding school was the next challenge and at 13 years of age I left home and headed to Perth to attend Methodist Ladies College. If nothing else, boarding school broadens your horizons. I learned to be independent and to look after myself. Many of you may know that MLC and Christchurch are located side by side along Stirling Highway in Claremont. In those days, my boarding house, Langsford House, was located right on the boundary of the school. On the other side of the fence, not 10 metres away, was the Christchurch Borders Year 10 common room, with a gate that was usually unlocked. But that's not where this story is going. What was always curious to me was that the girls in the boarding house were expected to manage our studies and attend to domestic duties such as our own washing and ironing and we cleaned on the weekend, while it seemed the boys on the other side of the fence were able to put their washing into a, into a bag and have it delivered back to them the following day while they had fishing passes and day leave. It just goes to show that even at that young age, women are able to multitask. <laughs> I enjoyed these years and the opportunities the school offered me. My interests tended towards art and music, but my upbringing meant I also played a bit of sport. I hasten to add, I was much better at literature, art and music than on-field pursuits. Unfortunately, the only sport sporting prowess I inherited from my father, who is an accomplished sportsman, is my love of the Fremantle Dockers. School was followed by university, a year of science, followed by three of marketing and the media. Again, the friends I met during this time have remained some of my dearest. On graduating, I left Australia for two years of travel and work overseas. Here I did everything from working for London Underground, I pulled beers at a pub in Ascot, I sold cocktails to tourists in Mallorca and I was a housekeeper come maid in a stately home in Essex. I had a fabulous time. Mr President, I have had a privileged upbringing. My family gave me the best possible start in life, a safe and loving home and an education that was second to none. Sadly, not every child has the same opportunity. An education is something that once gained can never be taken away. It is a pathway to employment, understanding and empowerment. Education breaks down barriers, racial, social and economical. It can put people on a level playing field depending on how they, play, how they choose to use it. It is a reality that if you live in regional WA, you may not have access to a school, university or TAFE close to your home. Or your school may not have a teacher that is qualified to teach science or English literature. It is also a reality that students from regional WA are poorly represented in the state's universities. We must get better at supporting families and students to make sure every child and adult gets the education they deserve. My mum, who is here in the gallery tonight, has taught more Year 1 students than she probably cares to remember. Those early years are so important. We must get better at supporting the people who teach our children. They are an important part of our community. You may recall that I mentioned names of pioneer, pioneering families of York Rakhine, including the Charltons, the Divers and the Davies. Some members of this house will also recognise these names as people who have served as members of this house. Sir Leslie Diver, the Honourable Eric Charlton and the Honourable Dexter Davies have all represented country people as members of the Nationals and its forerunner, the Country Party. As history has it, I believe I have Eric Charlton to thank for my family's involvement in state politics. He was a close neighbour and he convinced my father to attend his first branch meeting and from here stemmed a long association with the party. Dad was state president of the Nationals for 10 years. He took his place in this house in 1998 on Eric's retirement and his time here ended in 2001. Since then he has continued to work tirelessly on behalf of regional communities. I will, I will strive to apply the same dedication and tenacity he exhibits in daily life. I know him to be well regarded by members on both sides of this house and he is and will remain an inspiration and a mentor to me. Despite this political pedigree, my real interest in politics grew from my first job. My professional career started in the Honourable Max Trenorden's leader's office working as a receptionist and a research officer. Having shown little to no regard to the political process through school or university, I felt I had come home to the Nationals. I thank Max for giving me this opportunity. Opposition is a great training ground and my pre-season has been a long one. I continued on working in the Leader of the Nationals Office under the leadership of Brendan Grills until the private sector beckoned and I took a position with the Chamber of Minerals and Energy. This role took me to the northwest of the state. I was a regular visitor to Port Hedland, Caratha, Newman and other towns throughout the Pilbara. It is a vastly 
different environment to that which I grew up in, but the people and their stories are the same. Different faces, same stories. Mr President, I turn now to my electorate, the Agricultural Region. The region covers the four Legislative Assembly electorates of Geraldton, Moore, Central Wheatbelt and Wagen. It stretches from Kalbarri in the north to Bremer Bay in the south, and it is home to a diverse number of communities. The Electoral Commission defines the agricultural region as where the land is used primarily for agricultural purposes. This, well, this may well be the case, but there is also a wealth of activity beyond farming in this region. As luck would have it, last week the West Australian published a booklet titled The Wheat Belt Inside the State's Heartland. It provides a snapshot of my electorate and the diversity of the communities I represent. It begins with Borough Coppen, noted as the starting point for the construction of the first rabbit-proof fence. It highlights Meckering, a tiny town once flattened by an earthquake, that is, now, is currently promoting itself as the perfect base for fly-in, fly-out workers. It speaks of Westonia, home to the 98-year-old Edna May gold mine, once one of WA's richest mines and set to reopen on the back of improvements in the price of gold. And Meriden, soon to be home to one of the biggest wind farms in Western Australia. The men of Muck and Budden are about to hold the, the first men's shed conference in, and I quote, one of WA's most impressive men's sheds, built in 2007 after it was decided that a group of local retirees restoring farm machinery needed somewhere to work. What started as a group of men tinkering on machinery has grown into a forum for promoting men's health, combating depression and isolation, and raising funds to assist the local community. What a wonderful story. It also mentions Wickerpen, which was once home to Albert Facey, the author of the Australian classic A Fortunate Life, and it highlights the innovation of the Mora Shire Council, who came to the rescue of long-term residents of the Kingsway Tourist and Caravan Park in Madeley, who had received notice it was about to close. The Mora Shire re bussed residents up to the town and presented a pitch for them to move into a purpose-built lifestyle village on the outskirts of their town. The article says that 10 of the Kingsway residents are relocating to Mora. Durian Bay boasts a ballet school run by a former member of the Royal New Zealand Ballet and Europe Dance Troupe. And Darkin. Mr President, while I am speaking of Darkin, I would like to acknowledge another special person who is here in the gallery tonight, my granddad, Mr Donald South. Granddad is my mum's dad, and he and my nan, who is no longer with us but is certainly watching over us, raised my mum and her brother on the family farm in the Wheatbelt Shire of West Arthur. You see, Mr President, the country is in my blood, on both sides of the family. My nan and granddad, as with my nana and pop, were committed to their family, the farm and their community. My granddad is a true gentleman, softly spoken and generous, without pretension or a need for material things. In this fast-paced, materialistic world, I am pleased to say that we still have time for the odd game of Scrabble. While his preference would be not to step in Perth for the remainder of his years, he has made the journey to be here tonight. I return now to the towns of the agricultural region. In Katanning, almost 7% of the population are Christmas or Cocos Islanders. Originally attracted to Katanning to work at the meatworks, they are now a valued and unique aspect of the Katanning community. The booklet also mentions Wagen and the Wagen Development Association that has come up with a novel way to deal with excess groundwater in the Shire and create a new industry in the town. They are proposing to pump excess groundwater into fish tanks or ponds that will be appropriate for farming saltwater fish species. And finally, Geraldton, 450 kilometres north of Perth. It is a thriving town supporting agriculture, fishing and mining industries, and it is on the cusp of major growth. I could go on. Every town has its own story, far too many to recount tonight. The great qualities of innovation, adventure and pioneering spirit are in the blood and bones of the people in these regional communities. My dad said that in his maiden speech to this house just over 10 years ago. They are people that ask for little and give generously, even if the only thing they have to give is their time. It is not unusual to find the person driving the St John's ambulance also umpires the kids' sport on the weekend and turns up for the busy bee at the school. It has and always will be the case that country people wear many hats to make their communities work. They will adapt to their environment and find new ways to sustain themselves. But Mr President, there is no place for rose-coloured glasses when you are looking at life in the regions. Life can be tough. Our rock lobster fishery, one of the most valuable in Australia, is under immense pressure and the livelihoods of many families are under threat. Our farmers, whose livelihoods depend on the whims of Mother Nature, 
find themselves working in an ever-increasing competitive global market. As a government, we have recently given them another tool to deal with this changing world. I support the Minister for Agriculture's move to introduce GMO trials throughout the state and will watch with interest as they progress. New mines are being opened throughout the region and with the promise of a diversified economy, towns are faced with new population dynamics. Geraldton will become the hub for mining in the Midwest and it will take the commitment of all tiers of government, the private sector and the community, to apply lessons learnt from other parts of the state to maximise the opportunity for this region. <coughs> Balancing care for the environment with development continues to challenge us all. It is not a new phenomenon in the agricultural region. Long before it was fashionable to be green, our farmers and country towns were finding new and innovative ways to deal with rising water tables and the scourge of salt. I am firm in my belief that regardless of whether scientists agree or disagree with climate change, we all have a responsibility to reduce our carbon footprint. Mr President, while the physical environment can sometimes define regional Western Australia, it is the social fabric that makes a community. Recent events have shown that we still need to work hard to break down the barriers of racism in our communities. Is it too much to ask that everyone stops to take a moment to walk in another person's shoes? We are a lucky country. Our forefathers fought and died for the freedoms we enjoy today. In his inaugural speech, President Barack Obama said America's patchwork her heritage is a strength, not a weakness. Australia is not so different. I was proud the day Prime Minister Rudd said sorry to the Aboriginal people of this nation. There is still much work to do and it is incumbent on leaders of our community to continue to reconcile past deeds. But surely the first step in healing any rift is to utter that simple word. The unique social fabric of each of the communities in the agricultural region is what holds them together. They have chosen to live, work and invest in the region. Some, like my family, have been there for nearly a century. I hope others will move there tomorrow. I stand here ready and willing to listen to each of these communities. I will be their voice in this place. I ask all members to listen and learn along with me. And I will do the same when you are representing the needs and aspirations of your region. Mr President, it will surprise some people in the gallery it has taken me this long to mention President Barack Obama. Last year I joined the world watching the American presidential election with great interest as Barack Obama campaigned on hope, change and progress. It is my great hope his presidency is marked by the same stunning moments created during that campaign. I truly hope he can deliver on his promise to Americans and the world that change is possible. The context that Obama took his message to the people of America was not dissimilar to our approach in regional Western Australia. I am not overstating the point when I say that people living in regional WA were feeling neglected and forgotten. We are a resilient lot, self-sufficient and stoic. But in the lead up to the 2008 state election, the electorate was apathetic. We'd told them that one vote, one value would destroy their political representation. In fact, we'd done such a good job of convincing them that it would spell the end of regional representation, it took a lot of convincing on our behalf to show them that the Nationals had rallied in the face of adversity and were ready and willing to deliver the change they were looking for. Mr President, I think it's true that in each of us there's a Barack Obama waiting to burst out. Who hasn't dreamt of giving a speech that captures the imagination of thousands of people? Who hasn't dreamt of giving a nation of people hope and creating a sense of renewal and excitement? Who hasn't dreamt of giving the Yes We Can speech? Under the leadership of Brendan Grills and Wendy Duncan, the Nationals took the Yes We Can message to the regions. We stepped out of the election cycle and out of the campaign box and started the process of rejuvenation by inspiring the electorate. There was no room for the left or right of politics in this message. We were simply saying that if regional people wanted representation in the parliament, they needed to back the team that could deliver change. Of course, we did it without the pomp and fan fanfare that goes hand in hand with an American election campaign. We'd have been laughed out of town. Instead, we travelled to each corner of the state telling people that their vote could make a difference. Along the way, we collected people who had never considered voting for the Nationals before. We found the challenges facing communities in Port Hedland, Kalgoorlie, Kununurra and Tom Price were the same as those faced in any town in our traditional heartland. Different faces, same story. Every person has the right to a decent health service, an education system that supports and nurtures their children and the opportunity of gaining employment. Further to this, Every community should aspire to make their town or city a better place to live, work and invest. Royalties for regions will assist many communities do just that. 
Mr President, a bill to enshrine royalties for regions in legislation will shortly arrive in this House from the other place. It is my hope that all members will support the bill. It is my great hope that all country members of this House will support this bill. Royalties for regions is much more than the sum of royalties quarantined in the proposed fund. Some programs are what you see is what you get. Funding the Royal Flying Doctor Service was the right thing to do. Most country people don't have a Royal Perth Hospital or a Princess Margaret Hospital in their town. This is the next best thing. The Country Age Pensioners Fuel Card is a $500 fuel card to mitigate the cost of living and match both the ALP and Liberal Party's promise of free travel on public transport for pensioners. Developing the Ord will bring benefits to the entire state. It is much more than a commitment to agriculture. It is about developing communities outside of Perth, creating employment and wealth for everyone who lives in WA. It is absolutely the role of government to facilitate development and not just in the city where it may be cost effective. Royalties for Regions has also increased the boarding away from home allowance, a long overdue measure to support country kids and their education. Similarly, it has provided funding to create incentives to, to encourage our small and mid-cap mining companies to continue to invest in greenfields exploration. We should be in supporting industries that create jobs and revenue for our state. Mr President, these initiatives have obvious benefits. The effect will be almost immediate. Not all Royalties for Regions initiatives will have such an, an, an immediate impact. Some of the funding will create intangible profits. The real story behind Royalties for Regions is empowerment, communities taking control of their destiny and shaping their future. The regional grant scheme, the, community, the country local government fund and funding for community resource centres is the first step towards decentralised decision making. The notion that these communities will squander or waste these funds is laughable. They know the value of a dollar. They know how to turn it into three. At the risk of sounding clichéd, this policy has delivered hope. Change is happening and progress is not far behind. While Royalties for Regions seeks to redress years of neglect and centralised decision making, it is incumbent on us to start planning the next step. We need to re-examine the way we govern the region, regional and remote areas of this state. Cost shifting between tiers of government, a siloed approach to delivering services and infrastructure and centralised decision making has not served us well. I give notice that I will use my time in this place to better understand these processes and how they can be improved. A lofty ambition, but we should all be aiming high. To succeed would indeed be progress. Mr President, I am the sum of my life experiences and I have shared these with many people. To begin with, as this is the first opportunity I have had to speak, I would like to thank the Leader of the House, the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Greens for supporting the motion that passed through this place last year to reinstate me as a Member of Parliament. My journey to this House has not been without its challenges, and they do say that what doesn't kill you will only make you stronger. I am expecting the powers of Wonder Woman to kick in any time soon. <laughs> I would like to thank my parliamentary colleagues for their support and advice, and to Brendan Grills, you are an inspiration and the journey has been a blast. I look forward to the next four years. I extend a big thank you to the members of the Nationals for the opportunity to represent this great party, in particular Pat Hughes, Alan Marshall, Ian Robertson, Lee Hardingham and Darren Moyer. Thank you for backing a young woman to represent this great party. On that note, I will have to include a gratuitous tickety-boo and acknowledge and thank Darren for his advice and guidance over the past eight years. To Mr Doug Cunningham, a man who has taught me much, and the team in the Leader's Office, Jill, Ayla and Jane, who have shared so much of my journey, thank you. A special thank you to Susanna Ling and Marty Aldridge. It's an honour to have you as friends and colleagues. Thanks must also go to the Honourable Murray Criddle for his advice and counsel in my decision to run as a candidate. But I am nothing without my friends and family. To my friend Claire, who I've known since the first day of university, at the ripe old age of 30, you are about to become Dr Smallwood and I am the Honourable Mia Davies. Not too bad for two chicks who have slept in nearly every train station or bus port in Europe, stood in the rain to watch Jimmy Barnes at the Doodlekind pub and had a strategy for getting tickets to the ACDC concert. <laughs> to the De Pierre family, Colleen, Paul, Madeline and Julianne, you're really an extension of my family. There are not too many people in the world who can say they have friends they have known their whole life. Mads and Rich, I thank you for sharing your house with me last year as I saved to buy my own. Mr President, you will be pleased to know I'm nearly done. My last thank you is for my family. I've spoken about my father and the contribution he has made to this state through public life. At the end of the day, he is my dad. He is one of the most patient and generous men I know, and I love him. 
I spoke earlier of my mum and her contribution to this state as a teacher. She has stoically turned up to every National Party function as Dad's partner and continues to do the same for me. She is a confidant, counsellor and a friend and I love her. Finally, my sister Emma. Em, you make decisions about people's health and well-being on a daily basis. You deal with people when they are their most vulnerable and yet you remind me there is more to life than just work and I love you for it. This path will no doubt be challenging, but my promise to all is that friends and family make you a better person, so there should always be time for them. I will leave members with just one last anecdote. I recently attended the funeral of the father of one of my friends. They are a large family from the Wheat Belt, and as is the case at many country funerals, it seemed the whole town had turned out. I had never met my friend's father, but his story seemed familiar to me. Family farm, boarding school, kids, not too different to my own family. My friend gave part of the eulogy and he has given, permission, given me permission to relate this story. His father was at boarding school in Perth and by all accounts was a fairly outgoing fellow. He'd reached a crossroads in his schooling and had decided to return home to the family farm rather than stay on at school. On learning this, the principal called him into his office for a chat. He asked him why he was leaving and urged him to stay on to complete his matriculation. He was puzzled and said, Sir, I'm not really sure why you want me to stay. I'm not the brightest in chemistry or maths and I'm not your star footballer or track and field athlete. The principal responded that he was the sort of person they wanted at the school and that he had qualities that had earned the respect of the staff and fellow students. Mr President, it is my great hope that I can acquit myself of my duties as a member of this House with similar aplomb, perhaps not as the brightest or best but to make a contribution that will allow this parliament to make good decisions and provide governance that will bring change and progress for the benefit of all Western Australians. Thank you.